great desire for the word of God to be heard in this place. Uh, from no matter who comes in, whether they're saints or if they're sinners, whether they're young or they are old, God. Uh, give everybody a hunger, Lord Jesus, to hear what thus saith the word of, of the Lord, which is the truth. Uh, it is the word of God which has been spoken from the beginning of time. And it is the word of God which shall judge all in the end. Uh, I worship you, Jesus. You are mighty. You are holy. Uh, you are wonderful, Lord God. Uh, yes, if I had 10,000 hands, I couldn't clap enough to you. If I had 10,000 voices, that would be not enough to sing the praises that you are worthy of, O oh God. The angels of heaven which worship you are innumerable, O oh God. You are worthy of the praise. You are worthy of the glory. You are worthy of the honor, Lord God. O oh Jesus, you are holy, Lord. You are wonderful, Lord God. You are holy. There is a fire from the presence of God, people. Uh, if we can just push right now, get our minds off of what happened this week, uh, or what's the bills and all the problems, and just focus your mind on Jesus. Uh, you don't need to be too hyper or energetic if you can't, but you can be passionate. Uh, you can be passionate right now about Jesus. Uh, you can give him a kiss in the spirit. Uh, you can give him a hug in the spirit. Just worship him. Just praise his name. Uh, just thank him for his infinite goodness and his mercy, uh, which is everlasting, uh, the psalmist says. Uh, oh God, we worship you today. Uh, you are wonderful, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord God. Uh, you are a miracle working and a wonderful God. Uh, and it is such an honor to come before you into your presence, oh God, and worship you in spirit and in truth once again, Lord God. You are so good. Uh, where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. Uh, and I tell you what, this Wednesday night, I feel the liberty in this house. Uh, I feel the freedom in this house uh, because this is is where God meets with us uh, because this is where God's presence dwells. Uh, hallelujah. He is a holy God. He is a holy God. We worship him today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let's continue to pray, everybody. Continue to pray and get your mind on Jesus. Hallelujah. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out, Hallelujah. That's right, church. It's joined together in one mind and one accord. Like the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place and one accord. If we can get our minds and our hearts together, unified together, God can do some great things in this service. As little as this service might be, as few as the people that we are, hallelujah, God can do it. He can do miracles in this environment. I don't know about you, but everything isn't right in my life. I need to come through tonight. In Jesus' name. And we know people that are hurting tonight. We need to put them before us in prayer. If there's nothing in your heart that needs to be changed or needs to be fixed and everything's doing fine, think of the person that's hurting. Think of the person that's in pain. Think of the person that's sick. Think of the person that's struggling. Think of the backslider and stand in a gap before that person. Call out that only saving name. Let's call out the name of Jesus, church. Let's call it out here tonight. In Jesus' name. Lord, we love you tonight, Lord. We're asking you, Lord, to come into this place, Lord, to fill our hearts, to fill this, this room, Lord, with your presence, with your mercy, with your grace, Lord, to blow upon us again. That rushing mighty wind that they felt at the beginning of Pentecost, so we can feel it again today. Hallelujah, that mighty rushing wind blowing into this place. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We didn't come to some ordinary church. We come to a tongue-talking Holiness Church, baptized in Jesus' name, not some ordinary church. You want to be delivered, you're in the right place. You're in a church where Jesus is glorified, his name is preached, his name is taught. We get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. I'm so thankful tonight. Hallelujah, I'm thankful. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Come on. The fire isn't even up yet. Come on. It's just smoking flax. So can we keep praising God? I'm going to pass this microphone around. We need to get to praising the Lord right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Lord God, I thank you for the word that is coming, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, for your wonderful presence, God, that we already feel. And it's going to grow stronger and stronger as we praise you, Lord God. You are faithful. 
Lord God, you are holy. You are awesome, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord God. Right now, Lord God, we take dominion, apostolic dominion over any spirit that is going to try to bind us or hinder us. I pray, God, that you loose us to be able to worship you, Lord God, this Wednesday in Jesus' mighty name. And as the singers come to the stage to release praises to the only living God, let us all praise with them in Jesus' mighty name.
Hallelujah. How many stop and be in God's house tonight? That's right. You know, I was looking around this room and I was thinking about a lot of us. And I remember your first day into this church. And I remember, like, I remember my first day into this church. You know, some people may come in as visitors and they may look around and say, you know, we got it together. Things are, things are right. But it's good to remember that if you saw our broken condition we first came in, we wouldn't be too far off. We all were broken when we came here. And God, by his grace, he fixed us. You know, and by his grace, he's going to keep us right. And I'm thankful today that if I happen to be looking right and walking right and talking right, it's by God's grace that he fixed a train wreck like me, sobered me up, set my feet on solid ground, and brought me into a house where people love me and are praying for me and are there to support me. And if you're new here and if you're a visitor, God's going to do the same for you. And we're going to do the same. We're going to rally around you until you're repaired, until you're healed, until you're fixed. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You know, I don't think it's right to start a Wednesday night service unless I ask if there's a few testimonies. I know somebody has been doing something for you. Go ahead, sister. And it was loaded with my dirty goods from the end of the day. And I walk into the door, and a bunch of stuff just falls on the ground. And I'm like, oh, man, this is not the way to end the day. And it, um, so a bunch of water just went everywhere. And, you know, coming around the corner was this, was this lady who works cleaning dishes with a mop bucket and a dry mop. Yeah. Didn't know I was about to drop all that water all over the floor. I just was like... I'm not taking this lightly, sir. I am not taking this lightly. I didn't have to clean it up. And I just thank God for looking out for every tiny detail. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Go ahead, brother. A couple weeks back, we kind of forgot to mention a little testimony. Um, we went to the Dollar Tree to go grab some snacks and stuff. We got a bunch of snacks from Dollar Tree. It's cheap there. But anyway, <laughs> so we had just finished paying rent, and God provided miraculously, too. It was expensive. I don't know if I should say the number, but it was expensive, and God literally seen us through and helped us to pay that rent. Praise God. I didn't think it was coming, but he made it. He, he, he made a way. He provided. Hallelujah. That's my first testimony. The second testimony is we had a whole bunch of food, a whole bunch of snacks. We wanted, you know, some comfort food on Saturday. Praise the Lord. But um, when we went up there to pay for it, the lady before us, she paid the entire bill. So we got a bunch of free comfort food. Bless God. Thank you, Jesus. Just testify. Little thanks, Sister Crystal. He takes care of us even little things. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Talking about the little things, I had a big thing happen, like, just now. I found out like 30 seconds before we started singing that I was going to be the only one up there singing. But then my sister came up, and there she was, and she was my saving grace. So thank God for good sisters in Christ and for always being there for us 100% all the time. Big things, little things, God is always there. Absolutely. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I have one small testimony, but it, it, it's still great. I testified last week about how, you know, I put a little bit of money in the offering, and, and God sent me a check for over $200. Wow, I misspoke. I thought that maybe that was an escrow reimbursement. No, I got that one this morning. These checks are just, they just keep coming in. So I, I told Brother Joseph, I said, I might be able to quit working and just keep putting money in the tithes and, and live off the interest in Jesus' name. But, um, but yeah, he's been good, and he is faithful, and we've got to remember that in seasons of drought, in seasons of sorrow and in loss, he's still our provider. Yes. He's still Jehovah Jireh. Yes. And we bless him now. We like to bless him during the increase, but we've got to bless him and praise him during the times of famine as well. He's still worthy. He's still worthy. I was wondering, you know, would we be able to thank God and pray over an empty plate of food? 
Because there were those that did back in the day. Yes. You know, I mean, they say, I'm not going to stop thanking Jesus for what's what he's given me and what he hasn't given yet, you know. Yes. So I'm thankful that he's my provider. And oh, wow, it's, it's great to see everybody stepping up and, and um, filling in the gaps for the Dagan family and our pastor. As you know, they're, they're out of town. I'm going to get to the announcements in a little bit. But right now, I'd like to um, enter the time of prayer and ask if anybody has any prayer requests. And mention a few prayer requests for you all to pray for. Um, go ahead. No, just um, JD's in the hospital. Pray for your royal family and for JD's yes. family. Yes, absolutely. I believe he's at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. You can fill us in on that. There's Daddy over there. Yeah, I just got a text. Um, I guess he's got a major infection in his lower back that's going to need surgery. Um, a minor surgery, I guess, but they got to transfer him to Old Children's Hospital. So um, definitely, we need all the prayers we can. I might have to be here to go home to get stuff ready for her to um, to take in. So if I leave, just you know, don't be worried. That um, definitely all the prayers are for him. Well, I think we need to focus this time of prayer for you and for your family. If you want yeah. to step out here. And um, we're going to anoint you with oil. We're going to pray for you. Let's join together, church. Yeah. I don't know if you had any sick children, but all children's hospital, we've had a child there, and it's, it's a scary place. It's a serious place. Let's pray together in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to cover Jaden right now. Cover him, Lord, with your blood, Lord. Lord, I rebuke the spirit of fear right now, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you'll come through in a mighty way, Lord, that you'll be with little Jaden, Lord, and comfort his family, Lord, right now in this time, Lord. I rebuke this infection in his back in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this infection has got to flee in Jesus' name, church. That's right. We're pleading the blood of Jesus upon this situation. Help him as he travels up there, Lord. Help him, Lord, find a place to stay. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that they'll be able to fix this quickly with surgery. In Jesus' name, that they'll come out of this with a great testimony of your delivering power. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God does that. We've got a little child right there in a the blue shirt, Josiah. He was at All Children's for about two weeks. And to the left of him and to the right of him, babies were dying by the day. But God came through. God Hallelujah. took that place yes. and turned it around to a place of ministry. Yes. And right. my wife had a rocking chair and a King James Bible and a hymnal. And she was singing over our baby. And she was reading scriptures yes. to the nurses. So sometimes God's going to bring some light yes. into the darkness. And now if you've been around uh, Jaden and his family, they are light. Yes. And they are contagious. Yes. And, and maybe there's somebody there that they need to come to. And this is how God's going to do it. I don't know what, why God does what he does, but I think it's going to work out just fine. In Jesus' name. Thank you all, church. Um, it's time to give our offering, tithes and offerings, if we can pray over that. And we'll come by maybe on this side of the church. We'll hit this basket. And this side of the church, we'll come down the organized line and hit this basket. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the ability, Lord, to give back to you what you've already given to us, Lord. We thank you that you've given us health in our body to work. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us jobs and employment. Lord Jesus, you've always provided for us. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to give us the faith, Lord, to give back to you a percentage, a portion, Lord, of what you've entrusted into us for your kingdom, for your glory, for your building, for your harvest. We do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just singing that song, and I was looking around here, it reminded me of some things that, 
that we used to do, me and uh, Justin, Brother Justin Gardner, we used to meet in my house, and we used to have dinner, and all of our kids would line up, and this is when we were practicing to preach. We would set up a little music stand, and we'd get the Bible out, and we'd hand each other a, a little flash index card, and we'd preach from one scripture. And I'm telling you, some people may think it was just playing games, but we would preach a scripture, and we would sing, and we would play instruments, and we'd give the kids something to bang on. The Holy Ghost come down. Tears would fall. And where God, we're two or three in the midst, God is there. When you're there in his name, whether you're teaching Bible study or just playing church, you just might mess up and, and have the presence of God show up. So God's going to do that wherever you're at. I just felt like sharing that. Um, one announcement here. Um, Pastor and his family will be back on the 9th. They're going to be gone for a week. They're visiting family in Louisiana. And it's a well-needed rest and break. Um, they've been working relentless, especially the online lessons. If some of you have seen some of the pastor's online lessons, they'll still be playing. He's still going to be teaching Bible studies online, and um, they'll be a blessing to you. Tonight, we have a guest preacher, Brother Bowen. He also is the adult Sunday school teacher. Um, he teaches in rotation, does an excellent job. He's very gifted in the electronics and the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we did a Bible study a few years ago at the Morgan Center. And he, he broke out the, uh, uh, the, the power per, uh, you know, in a big old screen. And nobody showed up. But if they would have, it would have been great. I'll tell you what, it would have been great. But um, sometimes we just have got to occupy. So God bless the preacher for the bowling. Praise God. I heard um, Brother Walkley's testimony about um, the first time he came to church, he thought that they had it all together. Can you turn my mic down and get a lot of feedback on this? Yes, How he thought the church had it all together and everything. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, the first time I walked into a church, I thought they were all crazy. <laughs> they're dancing around in the spirit. They're shouting. They were acting. I never seen nothing like it. Of course, I was never brought up in church. And even if I was, I don't think there's too many churches like this. You have a seat. <laughs> She's waiting for me to come sit down. But the only reason I went back, I'll be real honest with you, is because the pastor had a really nice looking daughter. She was beautiful. So that's the only reason I went back for. Him. But as I went more and more, the Spirit of God started getting onto me. Hallelujah. It started dealing with me on things. Yes. So Almost 30 some years later, she's still my wife today. Hallelujah. But God has worked in my life in amazing ways. It hasn't always been an easy journey. Hasn't been always what I expected. But it's always been what he expected. Okay? And I'm going to tell you that I never saw myself standing up in front of a group like this teaching. And if it wasn't for Pastor Dagan, I probably still want to be doing it. Hallelujah. But he saw something that no one else ever tried to develop within me. And I thank the pastor for the opportunity to stand up here before you yes. and, and, and preach the word of God. It's just nothing like it, okay? I get more out of studying for these lessons than you ever get out of hearing me speak, okay? There's so much I get out of that, out of studying the word of God. I thought about this lesson quite a bit before I decided what I was going to teach on. And I really, I just couldn't come up with something. But then I get to think about what we're going through right now in this country. Oh, yes. What's happening in the world is something that's never happened before. Amen. Yeah. Okay? I have never remember a time in this country has been so divisive, so torn apart. I believe God is in the midst of this. Amen. This is happening for a reason. I want to start tonight with Matthew 24, 1 through 13. Now I'm going to read for the NIV version because it's a little easier to read. But if you follow along the King James, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. And the point I'm going to get come across is going to be the same. So verse 1, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him and, and to call attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he said? Truly I tell you, 
Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, what will happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of ages? Go to the next slide. Now this picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. You can see right across the way is a temple. Yes. It's right across the valley. I like to, when I'm teaching, put things in perspective. Because a lot of times you can read a scripture and the words, if you don't really bring them alive to what it's really meaning, you know, Jesus is sitting right across this valley and he's telling these people that temple's not going to be there much longer. Okay? And to the Jews, that was sacrilege. You are, you're talking about the destruction of the temple. So we're going to go on. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am Messiah, and, I, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see, that, see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine, earthquakes, and earthquakes in various places. Now, if somebody may have heard the pastor teach about this, nation against nation. If you look at that word, what nation against nation really is, look at the Greek, look it up. Go to the next slide. It comes to the word ethnos, which means, in this, I believe in this particular one, it means race. Race against race. Because I already mentioned kingdoms, so I'm thinking kingdom as countries, and nation against nation. We are seeing so much civil unrest in this country because that what was God said was going to happen. God said it was going to happen. 2,000 years ago, he's sitting on the Mount of Olives telling his disciples, this is what's going to happen. We are seeing prophecy unfold before our very eyes. We live in a time where things are starting to happen. Let's go to the next. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. Then you will be handed over to, the, to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase in wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. You have to stay in the race. If you give up the day before he comes back, you missed it. You have to go to the end. It's not about who comes in first or second. You just have to finish the race. Okay? Every day, you've got to keep going. Okay? Isaiah 5.20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We are living a time right now Everything's turned upside down. The whole world, what used to be wrong is now right. What is right used to be, you know, it's just totally messed up. What you have to accept today is crazy. When I was growing up, a young man, right, if you were homosexual, that was in the closet. That wasn't, out, but now they're out militant in your face. Now, I am not telling you that you should hate sinners. That's not what I'm telling you. You should love the sinner. But you have to hate the sin. You can't accept that behavior. You can't condone that behavior. All right? I, I find it hard for me. I see people laughing at sin or have any enjoyment from seeing other people commit sin. That, that's, a, that's a sin in itself. If you're laughing at somebody for some, uh, some sin, that's wrong. It's just wrong. Let's go to the next slide. In Chicago, on June 8, 2020, 18 people were murdered in a 24-hour period. 18 people in 24 hours. 18 people in 24 hours. Just think about that for a minute. That's almost one an hour are dying. 
Some of them were two, three years old. Okay, today, a three-year-old was shot in a car as somebody pulled alongside and shot into the car, hit the mother and killed the child, three years old, dead. That's the world we live in today. That's why you have to be ready to meet God because you don't know when that end's coming. Yes. It could come any time, any day. Any you just day. don't know. Yes. You think that we live in a safe place that's safe. But things aren't as safe as it used to be. When I was a kid growing up, my parents, my mom would tell me, you make sure you're in the house when those street lights come on. Right. You don't dare send a kid out today and tell them that. Right. You don't dare do that. You can't do that. Because there's too many people out there who would take those children. You know, my wife was watching a show the other day about the Amber Laws. You know, how that came to effect. And the little girl's name was Amber. And somebody just took her, off the, her from her home and killed her. Raped her and killed her. A little girl. A little, I think eight or nine years old. But that's the world we live in today, guys. It's a sick world. And we are the only recourse that anybody has being saved. If we don't let our light shine and we don't spread the gospel, these people are destined to go to hell. Amen. So let's go to the next slide. Some, some murder rate statistics. Number one city in the United States for murders is St. Louis per capita. 64 people out of 100,000 are murdered each year in St. Louis. Baltimore, 54 people are killed per capita of 100,000. Detroit, 40.54 per 100,000. We are living in a place where violence is coming the norm. Yes. If you don't like something somebody says, just shoot them. In, in, in my day when I grew up and somebody got in a fight, we, we duke it out. Damn they didn't have guns, they didn't shoot each other, but the streets today are violent, extremely violent, and they they watch these video games and they think taking a life is nothing more than, than shooting on a video game. There's no resets in life. Once you're dead, you're dead. Chicago, 2020, this year, 329 people have been murdered by the end of June. Almost two a day. Almost two a day. This year, 2020, end of June, eight soldiers were killed in combat total. It is safer to be a soldier in Afghanistan than to be a citizen in Chicago. That's the truth. That, that, they're the statistics. Let's go to the next slide. Keep going. They were supposed to advance all the back. Okay. This is, in the United States, the leading cause of death amongst black people is abortion. The next nine causes of death total doesn't reach the same as abortion. The next nine, okay? In New York City, half of the, of, of the, the babies are aborted. More than half are aborted. More babies are aborted than are born alive to black families. And the reason I'm, I'm going there is because we have such a racial divide in this country and we let it happen. Right. When you come in this church, there is no white, there is no black. Amen. We're all saints of God. Every one of us. Amen. That's what our nation needs. They need more God. They don't need more racial division. They need more God. They need to work together to move forward. 60 million babies have been killed since Roe v. Wade. 60 million. You know how many not, uh, Jews, not the Nazis killed? 7 million. We have killed 60 million babies since Roe v. Wade. Get your head around that number. 60 million. Everybody has, you know, said, well, look what Nazis did. They killed 7 million Jews. Yes, that was horrendous. But as a nation, we've killed 60 million babies. And we don't even think about it anymore. It's become normal. We accept it. We accept that. 
Has that been on your prayer list? Have you been thinking about those things? A lot of people, I think, just forget about it. It's just kind of, it is, it is what it is. We can't accept the norm anymore. We can't accept all these deaths. We can't accept killing babies. We just can't. We've got to move to a better place. We have got to be praying about these issues. Next slide. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. We live in a time when there is more television evangelists. Send me your money and God will bless you. Yes. They live in their big palaces. Yes. And there is people. I know, I know of people that will send money to a television evangelist yes. but won't support their local church. Yeah. Right. And this is where you're fed. This is where the, when you're sick, you're not going to call that televangelist up and say, pray for my family. Come to the hospital and pray for me. Okay. A year ago, my grandson was in the hospital. Pastor Joe, Joe Reagan drove from North Port, Englewood to Fort Myers, I went to Sanibel, to be with us when my grandson was in surgery and prayed with him. That's what a pastor does. That's what a real man of God does. He doesn't promise you all these riches because God didn't promise you anything. Read the Bible. He didn't say you're going to be rich. He said, worry not for what, you, what you're going to eat for tomorrow. You're supposed to worry about today, Amen. not tomorrow. God never promised you a brand new Mercedes. He never promised you a mansion. He promised you that he would take care of you. That's it. You don't deserve any more than that. Because if you had all those things, you probably wouldn't be here. You'd probably be someplace else. The things that we're facing today is violence, race division, financial division. Well, you're rich, right? People think when I own a business, I'm rich. I struggle every day just like everybody else. Yes. Okay? There is days, that, weeks that I don't get paid because i got to pay my employees. Yes. Okay? Everybody has struggles. No matter what you're going through, you have struggles. Right. Political division. Democrats against Republicans. I have never seen our country so divisive. Yeah. Everybody's arguing with everybody. You can't even have a plain conversation and talk about something without somebody getting upset. Oh, yes. My daughter bought me a MAGA hat for Christmas for my birthday as kind of like a little joke. People are all upset. I took the post down on Facebook because people got so upset by it. It's a simple little thing. Okay, why is it so divisive? You don't have to like the president. I don't agree with the president all the time. But you don't have to be so, you know, you get so upset by it. It's trivial little things. It doesn't matter. But as we face these things, there is things we can do as Christians to make our lives better, to make our lives more peaceful. Praying, fasting, studying your Bible, these are things you've got to do. They can't be a once in a while thing. They have got to be a full-time commitment. Being a Christian is not about coming to church on Sunday and Wednesday. It has got to be an everyday thing. Go to my next slide. Some people think going to church is like a checklist. I was in church on Sunday, check. I did that. My commitment's done. I came to church on Wednesday, check. That's done. That's what some people think church is about. Church is not about that. Church is a lifestyle commitment. Every day, you have got to make a commitment. No matter what I face today, I'm going to live it for God. I could go broke tomorrow, but I'm still living for God. Okay? No matter what happens, I'm living for God. And I'm going to do it every day. Because remember, he who finishes is saved. Okay? You have got to make it in your soul that no matter what happens, I'm going to finish. You look at any, look at the Delta Forces, Navy SEALs, the one quality they look for is the same quality God's looking for. They won't give up. They won't give up. That's what God wants. He wants you, no matter what happens, look at Job. He took everything from Job. He took his family. He took everything. But he wants to see Job not give up. We got to be just like Job. We will not give up. We will never give up. It 
can't be a checklist. I prayed 30 minutes a day, checked on that. It can't be routine. It has to be a commitment. If you just come home and talk to your wife once a month, what kind of relationship is that? Okay? How long is that wife going to stay with you if all you do is 30, you know, once every you know, month you spend 15, 20 minutes talking to her and then back out to your fishing or whatever? You have to develop a commitment. God wants the same thing. He wants a commitment. He wants to talk to you. He wants to have communion with you. He, he wants you to know his voice. When it talks about Messiah being, you know, people come and say, they're the Messiah. How can you know that's a fraud if you don't know the real Messiah? If you don't know the real Jesus Christ, when a fake one comes by, how are you going to know? How are you going to know who's a fake one, who's the real one? Because you've never talked to him. You've never spent the time to really get to know Jesus. And that's why it's so important that you spend that time. We are in a time. When the, 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 I really believe with all my heart, this is the beginning of the birth pains. Yes, is. This is the beginning. Yes. What you see happening now around us is the beginning. I don't know how long this is going to last. Mm. I have no idea. It may be a year, maybe 10 years. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. It matters that I finish the race. Right. Yes. Every one of us has got to finish the race. We've got to be committed to developing a relationship. Yes. It can't be a checklist. I prayed my 30 minutes a day. I'm good to go. you got to keep talking to Jesus until you develop a deeper relationship with him. You've got to have a deeper relationship with him, not just a checklist, not just saying, I did my time. I'm, now I'm going to go out fishing. I did my time. Now I can go to work. I did my time. So now I can go out with my friends and hang out. Jesus is the most important person in your life. He is the most important person, and you need to spend time with him. Yeah. Yes. I, my, my pastor at Fort Myers, Bishop Bruce, used to say, praying is like depositing money into a bank account. As you deposit it, it, it builds interest. It grows. Yeah. When you need that, you can call on it. Yes. But if you have nothing built up, you have nothing saved up, you have nothing with God, no relationship, who are you going to call on? What does God owe you at that point? Just think about it. What does he owe you? If you spent no time with him, you've made no commitment to do what he's asked you to do, you've made no commitment to the way, live the way he wants you to live, you've made no commitment to do the things he wants you to do and, or fulfill what he has called you to do, and then you're going to call on his name when you, when you need him? That's the only time you're going to call him is when you need him? If someone calls me, who I barely have a relationship with, and says, Ken, I need this great big favor. I might or might not do it. Depends on what, what other things I have going on. But somebody that I'm really close to, who's, who's means something to me, calls me and says, Ken, I need you to do this. More than likely, I'm going to do it if I can. Yeah, right. But if you built no relationship with our, with our Savior, and you just punch in the card, and that's all it is to you is a checklist, and you're punching the time clock, you have no real meaning in your life with God. You need to make a commitment. No matter what happens, I'm going to serve him. No matter what happens, I'm going to communicate with him. No matter what happens, he's going to be my priority. Yes. I think what's most important is that God, that you spend the time that you need to get through if praying 15, 20 minutes a day isn't enough for you to develop that relationship, then maybe you need to pick up the 60 minutes. Amen. If you're not getting through the way you feel you should, maybe it's not, it's not God's fault. That's right. You're not making the commitment that he wants you to make. Right. And maybe you need to, to kick it up a notch. Let's go to the next slide. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. The scripture doesn't say seek his face when, it, when you have time. Mm -hmm. doesn't seek, say seek his face when, when you can fit it into your schedule. Mm -hmm. doesn't say seek his face 15 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. It says seek his face continually. Mm -hmm. 
you have to develop that relationship, especially in the days that we live today. It is, the world is so dangerous out there today. When a mother and a three-year-old child can drive down the street and some guy pulls alongside and, and shoots at him. That's the world we live in. The most persecuted religion in the world right now is Christianity. Isaiah 5, 20-21. Woe unto them that call good evil and good, I'm sorry, evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. How many people do you know that think they're so smart But they can't see what's really what's happening. Your wisdom is not enough to get you saved. My intelligence is not enough to get me saved. I can't talk my way into heaven. It's only by him that I can get in. If I have no relationship with him, how am I going to get into heaven? This is a full-time job. Everything else is secondary. Okay? I've heard the pastor preach it many times. God is number one. number one. Your family is number two. Boom. Church is number three. Yes. Don't confuse church and God. Amen. They're not the same thing. Church is a time we come together to worship God. Yes. But you should have your own time to worship God. Amen. As an individual, you need to have that relationship. I cannot rely on Pastor Dagan's relationship with God to get me into heaven. Yes. All right? You can't rely on his relationship. You can't rely on it. We have to have a personal relationship with God. When we think about persecution around the world of Christians, we think of China, Vietnam, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Afghanistan. But it's happening right here in North America. I'm going to read you a couple comments. That, this one's from October 9th, 2019. This was a presidential candidate. When former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke was asked if religious institutions College, churches, charities should be stripped of tax-exempt status Thursday night by CNN anchor Don Lemon during the LGBTQ town hall. He immediately responded, yes. There can be no reward or benefit, no tax breaks for anyone or any institution, any organization in America that denies the full human rights and full civil rights of every single one of us. He said, so president, so as president, we're going to make that a priority. We are going to stop those who are infringing upon human rights of our fellow Americans. It goes on to talk about if you preach against these behaviors, he's going to move your tax exempt status. And, and some Democrats have agreed with him. Yes. The, the guy running for president, Joe Biden, has said that he's going to put Beto O'Rourke as in his administration. So if we preach against certain behavior that, that they don't like, they're going to penalize us. That's right here in the United States. The about, a, a border school division bans offensive Bible verses. This is August 6th, 2017. The Battle River School Division, a school division in the western province of Alberta, has ordered Cornerstone Christian Academy to refrain from reading or studying any scripture that could, could be considered offensive to individuals. One chair member claims that human right legislation prevents religious schools from teaching what a child or parent might find offensive. So this school district in Canada is saying if a scripture offends somebody, you can't read it or teach it in your school. This is a Christian school. They're slowly creeping their way they like to creep their way into churches. They like to get control. In Houston, Texas, the mayor subpoenaed five conservative pastors. He wanted to see their sermons before they preached them. Houston, Texas. So you think that it's not here. 
but it's slowly creeping in here. You can put down Christians, but you can't put down Muslims in this country. Things have a way of slowly creeping in. I remember back in the 70s, TV shows were very mild compared to today's standards, but they slowly creep stuff in, and it gets worse and worse and worse. You don't even realize it's happening until it's done and over with. And that's what's happening in our society today. They're letting things creep in slowly on us. They say Christians are one of the most persecuted segments in our society. facing challenges today, and I just named a few. But Jesus foretold this 2,000 years ago. He told us this was going to happen. We knew it was coming. Okay? It's not a surprise to us. But as we face these challenges, there's some things we need to take to heart. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 22. Now we exhort you, brethren, Warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Go ahead. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. So we live in a time when you need to, you need to go back to the scriptures and read it from time to time. Praying without praying, cease, you know, without ceasing. We live in a time you need God more than ever. Amen. You need Him. You really need Him. I need Him. Yes. Amen. Because you don't know what's going to happen. You're driving down the interstate, and some guy decides that you doesn't like the way you're driving, pulls alongside, and put a bullet in you. That's the world we live in. The violence is increasing so much. I never thought I'd see a day but this was, you know, when I was a young man, when I was Brother Joseph's age, just starting a family, the world was so much different. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay? Me and my wife lived in Kensington, Philadelphia. It was by her parents' house. It was, it was a rough neighborhood, per se, but it was nowhere near what it is today. Every time we go now, you know, my wife doesn't like guns. She hates guns. When we go there... She wants me to carry my gun. Because it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. Times have changed. And we need to to know that God told us this is what's going to happen. And there's a reason this is happening. Because he's ready to come back for his people. Times are changing and we need to make sure that we redouble our efforts to have a relationship with him. It can't be just punching that clock anymore. It can't just be when we get time. I know we're busy. You know, you got to go out and work every day. You got to make money. You got to do those things. I get that. I really do. Okay? This week's been a very busy week for me. But I still find time to put God as a priority in my life. Because God's done so much for me that if I didn't do it, I'd feel bad because God has done so much. We're talking about Brother Louie with his son in the hospital. My son's 34 now. He was one year old. And the doctor said, he's not going to live. That's what they told me. You need to prepare. You're going to be buried soon. It was his exact words. He's not going to live. He had um, spinal, viral spinal meningitis. And they said he's not going to make it. He was diagnosed. The doctor misdiagnosed it. 
went too far before they did anything, he's not going to live. I had a pastor every day went to the ICU. They thought he was a grandfather. They let him in. Every day for seven days he prayed for him. The seventh day, they told me to take him home. They can't find a trace of it in his spinal fluid. I know that God is there. I know God can do the things you need him to do, but you need to have a relationship with him. How can I expect God to do stuff for me when I don't even talk to him? How can I expect God to fix the things in my life that I've messed up if I don't have a relationship with him? And we are in troubling times, guys. Yes, we are. Okay? We are in troubling times. There's so much hatred out there. The devil has got everybody up in arms. Now, I realize there's people with legitimate complaints. I get that. Is there abuse of power? Absolutely. But I honestly believe that most of this is not against the peaceful protesters. It's people that have usurped their protest and destroyed private property for their own benefit, or looting stores, or burning stores down. Is that what Martin Luther Luther King said he wanted? And look what he did through peaceful protest. We have to come together as human beings and work together to resolve these problems, right? But I fear that it's not gonna happen. I fear that it's gonna get worse and worse because that's what God told us was gonna happen. I just want us as a body to work together. When you are in this, this church and you're a member of this congregation, color has no barrier, no meaning here. Okay? We are all Christians together. And nobody can tell me any different. I won't believe it. I care about my brothers, whether they're white or black. There is no difference. I'll do the same I would do for anybody else. We're, we're, we, are, we are one. Right? How can I hate my foot? You know what I mean? You're part of the body of Christ. Yeah. I'm not going to cut my arm off because it's, it's brown. I don't like it anymore. I would never do that. So how can I hate my brother just because he's not the same color I am? That makes no sense to me. Right. And anybody who does that is not part of Christ. Amen. He's not filled with the Holy God. Same Holy Ghost I got. Amen. Because that doesn't exist in, in God's church. Because I hate to tell some people... I see people that are in church, not in apostolic churches, but in church, and they really feel there's only going to be a white heaven. I hate to tell you that's not the truth. All right, we're all going to be there together. If you've got a racial problem, then you're going to have to stay home. Yep. <laughs> all right? God is love. And if I can't love my brother, then we're not going to be there. It's just not going to happen. Okay? So I encourage each one of you today. We're in troubling times. Don't mess up. Don't forget to pray. Don't make it, make it a priority in your life that you're going to, this week, get closer to God. Okay? When I mean get closer to God, some people will come into church and they'll act like there's something. Now, I'm not saying in this church, but I've been in churches, right? I told the story before. I just one woman in church. Every Sunday, she'd come up and want to pray the devil out of me. That went on for years. Today, I'm in church. She's backslid. Okay? Because she didn't have a real relationship with God. She doesn't have that relationship. Okay? But that made her feel better that she was somebody. And God, we're all the same. Whether you're the pastor of this church or you're the janitor, to God, you're all the same. You have different positions, but we're all the same. God loves each one of us the same. We're all his children. We're all the bride of Christ. Okay? It doesn't matter who you are. As long as you do what he wants you to do, you pray, you develop that relationship, God will bless you. He may not bless you with your Mercedes, Brother Joe, but he will bless you that you have food in your belly. Okay?
Okay? So, as we go through these troubling times, let's pray for each other. All right? We need to really immerse ourselves in what's happening. God foretold these things, and you need to take it take, take real, what's happening. This is really some unprecedented times. Okay? And there's going to be a time they're going to come in and tell us what we can preach and what we can't preach. And we're going to have to make decisions on what we're going to do as a congregation. Are we going to stand up for God? Or are we going to bend to the government? I know what I'm doing. Amen. Do you know what you're doing? You know? So, Brother Joseph, would you end us in prayer? Thank you, Lord God, for this wonderful message, Lord, that has been spoken today. I pray, Lord God, that you please help us all to receive it and apply it to our lives yes. with faith, Lord God. That way we can all grow into a perfect uh, into a perfect temple, Lord Jesus, a perfect yes. body of Christ, Lord God, together on this earth, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to go forward and strive for unity and strive for peace with all men and holiness, Lord. Yes. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Lord, you're all dismissed. In Jesus' name, hallelujah.